I'm here with Roberto Blake at Social Media Marketing World 2020, and it's good to see you. Now, uh, we have traveled the country together. Yes. We've been at different different conferences. We've um, been roomies. Yeah, we have been. We yeah. have been. What's one of your favorite memories of, of us doing what we do at these conferences? I think one of my favorite memories of us, like, is just actually all the dinners. Like, yeah, all the good. dinners and uh, cocktail hours, well, for cocktails for me, like, <laughs> those were probably some of the best conversations yeah. of my entire life life and like you're just like you're a riot to be around I love your energy and your enthusiasm it's something I always look forward to at these events yeah well thank you so much I, I appreciate that and I love getting our heads together and hearing different opinions different sides of things and and how the video process works out so that's what I want to dig into uh, with you today my first yeah. question for you is what is the biggest reason that YouTubers fail? Oh, that's a really interesting one. So I think the biggest reason that YouTubers fail is like that. Well, you put me on the spot with that yeah. one. But like, all right, this is mostly my opinion. So take this with a grain of salt. This is gonna be some tough love. But um, <laughs> the reason that I genuinely believe that most YouTubers fail, and YouTubers, by the way, there's like a 99% fail rate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with, well, where's the where's the measuring post? Where's the goal post for success on right. YouTube? What are we qualifying as right. that? And there's a lot of different ways to calculate that. You still end up with like 90, 95% people failing because it's the same reason that a lot of people fail with an online business owner. Okay. And you know why? Why? They don't keep going. That's a big part of it. But let me get more involved with that because that's just easy to say. It's like, oh, people fail when they quit, when right? They stop, yeah. That's, that's too fluffy for a lot of people. Yeah. So recently I've been working on a massive case study. I'm hoping to finish it soon with our friends over at TubeBuddy. Great. I've been collecting a lot of data, looking at like um, the data from 20 million videos, 3 million million channels. This wow. is like one of the most involved case studies that's ever been done yeah. of the YouTube community. And I, I did with the idea of I wanted to see if a lot of the myths and assumptions we make about the platform have any data to back them up. What are some of those myths? Like, give me an example of a myth. I think that there is this myth that most of the largest content creators just kind of blew up out of nowhere. Right. When there's a pattern of consistency that most people that have over a million subscribers on the platform, the average lifetime of their channel is between five and seven years old, Owen. Okay. Which is, which you and I both slow know. Slow climb. Slow climb, but you and I both know that that correlates to the length of time it usually takes people to be successful with a business. Yeah, absolutely. So that's very important. And then a lot of people, um, I know why people push this whole narrative of quality over quantity, mm -hmm. but in the case study that we did, consistency, when I hear quantity, I'm not hearing upload for upload's sake, upload for upload's sake, you right. and I have talked about yeah. that. I'm talking about what is sustainable in terms of That's the good. lifetime of your career. Because right. what people don't realize is like, what's the lifespan of your career? Okay. What does consistency look like? What can you maintain with that? And what if your life changes? Like Roman Atwood went from being a prankster to being a family vlogger because he got married and had a family. Yeah, you can't, yeah. like, you know, it's like, what is it gonna be, a 40-year-old prank channel? Did he change the channel? Did he start He made a, a new channel. A, okay, he made a new yeah. channel. But he transitioned the audience that was loyal to him as a person and right. liked his personality right. versus the spectacle of the prank. And that's important, to, that's important to distinguish between because he knew that putting family content on a prank channel would not work and that's important to to note and then you have you know you have Casey Neistat that went from um, high level uh, conceptual quality filmmaking yeah. um, on occasion uploading every now and again yeah. to then literally becoming a high production daily vlog yeah. but he scaled back to what is sustainable for a one-man band, or like what's what's barely sustainable yeah, for a one-man band I, when I've he did seen, that. I've seen so many great channels. I'm trying to think of the name of one, but it was like it was like a Seven Tips channel or like Did You Know kind of a channel. This guy created amazing content. He's one of the first content creators that actually got me on the platform as a consumer. Uh, and after about seven videos, he just fizzled out and it, it went away because he made great videos, but it wasn't sustainable to his lifestyle. I have seen that a lot of times. One of my favorite channels had over 600,000 subscribers. Wow. Have been doing it uh, for like about maybe six or seven years, but then a lot of things happened with YouTube monetization mm -hmm. that affected um, their channel because it wasn't they were doing super edgy content, but some of the jokes were not safe for work. Got it. And it was highly produced. Like multiple characters had some animation stuff in there and everything like that, had these skits it was like really well done content and it was quality and they were doing a lot of it but that was financially not sustainable right. once um, they had some hiccups with their ad revenue right and so people don't even think about the financial 
viability or sustainability of the type of content yeah. they want to make. It happens a lot in the business too because you start pouring all of your money into the business and without turning an, a, hard, a strong enough profit and then you notice we can't, we can't sustain this business. So what you're saying is the reason, the biggest reason that you see is because uh, creators are not being consistent. They're either like spending way too much time up front on high quality and they can't sustain that or it's such a low quality that it never gets traction on the platform. Exactly so. So yeah, consistency is the biggest thing and balancing out uh, things like quality, quantity, investment, time, yeah. resources, and then also your lifestyle. Yeah. Like being a content creator is a lifestyle choice. Being an entrepreneur is a lifestyle choice. Right. And my biggest thing is I'm trying to, I've pivoted a lot in my conversations about this and the big thing that I'm telling people is let's have a common sense approach mm -hmm. to being a content creator. Let's take a common sense approach to social media. Let's take a common sense approach to business and entrepreneurship. Yeah. And but what that means in many cases for people is they need to figure out what making it right size in their life yeah, that's good. looks like. That's good. You know, what are your thoughts then for like a, an entrepreneur who wants to be a YouTuber? And by that, I mean someone who is a thought leader in their space, you know, maybe they're in the insurance industry or a real estate agent, and they're becoming really well known. They're, they're being asked to speak at all the conferences. How does that person add video now into their lifestyle so that they can amplify and scale the visibility that they're getting? I think for someone in that situation, mm -hmm. it's the same as somebody who works a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. You have to find a way to do this without taking away from your responsibilities, without compromising the quality of the work that people rely on you to do. Yeah. And while of course, you know, being able to provide for your family mm -hmm. in that situation or take care of yourself if you don't have a family like me, the single guy. The, uh, but the, the thing that I would look Hopefully at- not for long though, ladies, right? Like, don't let that stop you. Hashtag forever alone. Uh, <laughs> but no, but seriously, um, the thing again with making that right size in your yeah. life is also looking at um, where can you delegate things in your life right now yeah, to free up right. the appropriate time for you to concentrate a certain portion of your effort here without taking from something else. So someone has to pick up the slack there. Yeah. Like, because the other thing is people overwork themselves. They yes. take on too much right. and then you can't deliver for everybody. You can't be consistent. You can't be reliable. You let people down. Yeah. So you, like, I think people take on too much when they add this to their plate without taking something off. Right. So you have to take something off, which means you either have to learn how to automate certain things or you have to get help, have people um, do that. Or if you add this to your thing, sometimes you have to figure out how quickly you can overcome the learning curve yes. of becoming good and fast right. enough to make it worthwhile. And you also have to, in my opinion, you can't do this to the, the detriment of your financial well-being. Right. It doesn't make sense, right, to Correct. do it. Now, do you need to have the world's greatest camera no. And the world, okay. D. Nimmin is the master of mobile. Yeah. Our yeah. friend D. Nimmin is the master of mobile. He's built an entire YouTube channel about that. And he walks the walk in the sense that he makes most of the content the way that he tells you to make the content right. from the mobile devices for right. that. And so I think that that's very powerful. We, when we were at VidSummit, saw someone do a tri video setup similar to what we have going on here yeah. with only smartphones and run the entire operation from an iPad. I, I love that. I love those softwares. And I think that that is going to be a huge tool for creators to take advantage of. Let's talk about success on YouTube, okay? okay? What's the big thing that if most creators just grasped this one thing, this one concept, they would be successful on YouTube? What's that one thing? I had an interesting conversation with a YouTube employee. Okay. And I'm actually saving, I've been saving some of this for a bigger video on my channel, but I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll let the Owen video. Nice sneak it. peek, so. folks. What, um, what I was told is this. I was told this about the YouTube algorithm. I was told this not as a secret. I was told this probably so that I could actually tell people about yeah, it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, Don't, Don't say, say a word, word right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so what I was told was that YouTube doesn't look for viewers for your videos. It looks for videos to give to the individual viewers. We in the YouTube ecosystem have mm -hmm. been dealing with a culture that feels as content creators that everything should be creator first, creator first. Right. That makes no sense yeah. because viewers are everything to us and to the advertisers. So big. Yeah. And the advertisers allow for the investment for us to be able to have all these great tools that mm -hmm. let us focus on just being content creators. So if we look at the hierarchy, the viewer has to come first and then we're in partnership with YouTube. So us and YouTube as a platform are last in the equation because they have to and we have to think about what value we deliver to the advertisers right. because they're 
paying us. Yeah. We cannot ask for to be paid in exchange for not creating value. Yes. So yeah, the advertiser does sit in the hierarchy above us, and I know that's frustrating for content creators, right. but the thing is you have to think about it in the relationship of you're asking someone as a viewer for attention, so you have to deliver for them, obviously, but then if you're asking for someone for money, you have to be a good vehicle for them to get a return on that investment. Are you talking about like if you're selling a course or are you talking well, no, about No, I'm talking about ad revenue. I'm okay. talking about right, yeah. I'm talking about in the sense that not even just with a sponsorship or brand deal, but that's the obvious one. If you if you're gonna take money from a brand, you yeah. have to be confident and honest about whether you can deliver for them. If you don't think you can deliver for them and you take their money, then you're not doing good business. You're right. not you're not being honorable, right? right? Well, with content creators, because of the passive nature of YouTube, yeah. there's the expectation of my videos should be monetized. But what I've noticed is no one ever asked themselves, is my content a good vehicle for selling anything? And is that in the best interest, not only of the brand, but is that in the best interest of my audience? Yeah. Is it in the interest of my audience for to interrupt the video at this point so that somebody can sell soap yeah. or sell yeah or sell camera gear or something. Like, it's that entitlement culture that is intrinsically a part of being a creator, right? Is, yeah. is you, you can't just create what you want to create. You have to take what you want to do and match it up to what, what consumers want to see vis-a-vis -vis what YouTube can monetize. You have to think about the word alignment. It's not about selling out. It's not about not doing what is authentic yeah, to you or what you good, want. Man. It's about alignment and saying, you know, I want to do this thing, but why should somebody care? Right. I want to do this thing. Why would someone invest in this? Because they're not investing in it to support me. They're investing in it because they want to return right. on their investment. So am I a good partner for that? And the thing is, sometimes it's okay if that's no. There are brands you right. don't want that's advertising right. to your audience. Yeah. Look, look, it, the way the world, the world works and the country works right now, I made a conscious decision. You know, I could be raking in money right now. I made a conscious decision to turn political ads and block political ads wow. off from my YouTube channel. You will never watch my YouTube channel and see a political ad play before the video or interrupt the video with a politician trying to to sell you on their vision, yeah. okay? Um, regardless of what side of the aisle they sit on or what they believe in, I decided that it's not in the That interest. seems very you, yeah. right? Because I know you, we've, we've known each other for a long time. That seems like a very you thing to do. Right, but again, a lot of people are not comfortable with the idea of turning down money and asking themselves, this isn't in the best interest of my audience. Right. And I think that you have to be willing to look at what you want to do and then find a way to you know, make your audience a real priority. Yeah. I think if people could grasp the idea of what are my priorities, whether it's the audience, whether it's uh, the financial side, I think if people are honest with themselves, Owen, and self-aware about what their priorities are, right. that they will be more successful. But I also think they have to define what success means to them personally. Mm -hmm. Is success the acknowledgement of a large group of people, or is it just being part of a community of like-minded people? Yeah. Because I, I don't make content for everybody, Owen. I was a nerd in high school. I wasn't popular then. I'm not trying to be popular now. A lot of people try to judge me because they want to be popular on YouTube. They want a million subscribers. Yes. They want all the yeah. views. I just want to make content to help people like me right. who are trying to accomplish certain and specific goals. You know what? Like, we ain't all out here trying to get washboard abs. But for the people who are, then, yeah. you know Tune into this channel. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, the viewer is the most important thing because they're the one driving this whole system. The whole thing. And as a creator, if you're sitting there thinking, like, I want to create what I want to create and you have to like it, you're going to just, it's like hitting your head up against Exactly. So what YouTube told me was, and it changed my perspective of how I teach creators, yeah. is that if YouTube itself as a platform is always trying to put the viewer first, because like creators complain so much, but if you think about what your experience is as a viewer, it's never been better, Owen, to be a viewer yeah, I agree. Uh, of YouTube content. They're always sending me stuff that I like, that I would want to see, and I, would, I didn't really necessarily search for it either, right? Yeah. YouTube just kind of says, hey, you know, guys like you tend to like stuff like this. Yeah, and that's the thing, is when you think about that, so I think what would make people successful is if they think about that, and then they say, I wanna lock into a specific audience. I'm not making my videos for everybody, but did I also make a video that not only would this specific group of people love and share it in that community, whatever that community is, yeah. like, but is this something that, without being a hardcore member of that community, could other people enjoy it? I'll give you a real world example. Yeah, that's good. I have a, I have a friend, a good friend of mine who uh, came up in my YouTube community as a viewer. He started his YouTube channel, he started watching my content, and then um, I saw him in my comments, and then I even did a channel review for him, and we've become good friends since there, and we yeah. talk about this stuff all the time. He's massively successful. His channel's about to hit 700,000 subscribers. Great. cool. And he has a, a channel, he covers anime, Dragon, covers Dragon Ball. So yeah, like okay. Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Super. And I explained to him that 
the way he titled a video, he titled it for hardcore right. uh, fans. Jargon like, and, exactly. and like slang, yeah. But it's like, I'm like, I would click on that video, but my younger brother and sister who also grew up watching Dragon Ball would never click on that video because you went too deep for them, it's over their head. Yeah. Because like, they've watched every episode, but they don't remember the name of the creator of yeah, the series. Okay, like, you did, like, they don't know who Akira Toriyama is. But if you had said the creator of Dragon Ball Z or the creator of Dragon Ball, then they would have still clicked on the video. Make it accessible to the casual fan. I'm a Star Wars nerd. Yeah. You know, if you if like if you want to reach the casual everyday person, yeah. you talk about Luke Skywalker, you talk about Princess Leia, you talk about Han Solo, yeah. right? But if you reach a hardcore Star Wars nerd like me, then you're going deep and you're talking about some other obscure sure, characters references. like Darth Bane or Darth Revan right. or something like yeah. that. So okay. it's the obscurity. So like when, when, if we are sometimes, we get into here's where I'm at yeah. without it, thinking about, okay, are 99% of people also where yeah. we're at? <laughs> yeah, so, so what's the, where's the drawing line? Like at what point is the audience too broad Right where where you're, it's just too big to really get any traction. And at what point is it Star Wars fans? Right? Is it like is your audience Star Wars fans, or is it really gen, general population with some Star Wars fans? Do you understand you the question? To, yeah, you have to think about that and make that decision as a content creator. I can't tell you what's the right. So for you let me ask you this then, like. Uh, let's go back to the real estate agent example, right? So okay. am I, as a real estate agent, am I, am I trying to become attractive to anyone interested in real estate on YouTube, right? Or am I trying to become only attractive to people in my locality that are looking to buy a home? With what you want to be known for mm -hmm. and where you can compete and win. Alexander the Great is one of my favorite historical um, references. Yeah. And a, a, a strategy that you would look at is, what is a small territory that I can conquer? Okay. And that might not be geolocation because they're just not, that might be way, way too it's specific. It's like mind space, right? Yeah, like it's mind share. It's like, that might be really too specific. So I would focus on either an aspect of real estate or an aspect of the real estate community, mm -hmm. AKA I would f focus maybe on first time real estate investors. Okay. Okay. So maybe that's it. Or maybe- What I about like gated communities? Or, like well, again, that might be specific, mm -hmm. but that might be way too narrow mm -hmm. to get enough traction in terms of okay. people opt in versus opt out. Got it. But first time real estate investor is specific enough. Yeah, and that's but a there's wide. A, and there's people every day being told that that's how you should retire or that's what you should look into now that you have a little bit more money or hey, if you want to. No, that's good. Like, so there's, yeah. enough, there's enough existing attention and a constant new funnel of attention to use one of your favorite things. Right. There's a constant funnel for that. So another aspect of that could be um, doing the versus model of um, small unit versus large unit. Yeah. Um, another, oh, another specific dynamic could be wholesale real estate. Yeah. Another. And you're building out an entire like content silo out yes. of this. And see, the thing is, you're not trapped because if this, then that. So yeah. you can move over to another silo of that That's and right. not lose those people. That's and right. not, That's you right. could also add another dimension of, okay, if I picked this bucket that then is topic specific, now let me put, pick a narrative thing that plays to me, yeah. which might be maybe somebody does a monthly income report series about their gains and losses, wins and losses as a real estate agent. Yeah. But instead of titling it, oh, monthly income report at yeah. the beginning, you, you um, title it with something more relevant. Like it's like, um, my tenant screwed me over. Oh, that's good. Yeah, something a little bit more inflammatory the that kind of gives you. The, yeah, the truth about uh, being a landlord. So it's important to take a look at what you're gonna present and then think about the context that would best present that content online. Exactly, it's like, yeah, you could go um, something like, um, you know, the Flip Life Chronicles, uh, Life of a Real Estate Agent. Yeah, you know, like of some, really if, you're, if you're into flipping real estate, right? right? You could like, you but know. But you wouldn't wanna go from like flipping real estate to, to like, um, you, you know, single family homes necessarily, right? Like if you're in real estate investing and then you start all of a sudden talking to like it renters. De it depends on, you could do that because it depends on where in your journey you are. Okay, so at, not yeah, at that's the, good. Not the beginning, but once you've established Later a on. foothold and a name, so you always have to think about the evolution of your journey and, so your, and your channel. That's and, so big. And you need to think about, okay, 
narratively where you need to reevaluate where you are narratively yeah. at any point in your career. Right. You also have to accept the idea of audience attrition, which is something people don't talk about. I haven't even really talked about the fact that the longer you're around, you can't expect through the evolution of you as a human being or the evolution of your content that, look, there's gonna be people who started out with you, but they're not into doing that thing anymore. So they never hit unsubscribe or anything, but they're out because their life doesn't you know, fit this has up. changed. You haven't changed with them, yeah, right. or or exactly. you, you went to separate ways. One right? of the, yeah, one you guys went your separate ways. Every relationship, like every relationship, has a lifespan. That's right. And the idea that we should have so much of our audience active all the time or something like that doesn't respect the simple fact that they have lives that have nothing to do with us, right. and their loyalty isn't first and foremost to us. Their loyalty is to what they're trying to get out of life. And yeah. we, we may not play a role in that anymore. That's right. And that's no reflection on them or us. Yeah. So it's the, it's the interesting weird thing of trying to say don't take it personally. And I know how hard that is, but I, I'm again, trying to use this common sense realistic idea of why we shouldn't take these things so personally and take it to heart mm -hmm. and take it as a rejection because it doesn't have anything to really do with us. Yeah, I think that people struggle there. I think that they really do because you've built this career on, or you're starting to build this sort of career, this passion around topic A, but topic A may not be what produces well online. So you've got to produce sort of like, you know, topic B and C to bring those people into your channel where they can then be introduced to topic A because they like you now, they trust you. You brought them in on this higher level content. You have to think about what the gateway is to people who gateway. don't, the gateway to people who don't know you, yeah. don't care about you, don't have a reason to, what's the gateway, what's the icebreaker for them? Because yeah. in the real world, if you were trying to establish a relationship with a stranger out of thin air, they don't know who you are right. and they don't know your credentials and they haven't heard of you. And even if, even if you're a big name, that's not necessarily a reason for them to care. It right. might get their attention. Sure. That's not a reason for them to actually genuinely care. Right. Like, I mean, to be very real, if you, if I'm introduced to somebody as a champion surfer, I'm like, okay, good for you, I'm not interested. Yeah. But then if I find out that it's like, but if my context of how I'm introduced to them is that this person is wonderful and is um, a philanthropist in this charity yeah. and all these things, and it's something I care about and everything, then, I care about that thing and we both care about that thing and I have a gateway sure. to be investing in you and then it's, oh, that's so cool that you're a surfing champion. Well, what's your story? Because I care about you now, so I'm interested in your right. story. I may not ever have any aspirations of surfing, but- You went I, to this college and I went to this college. But right. Right, so something like, like that. So now I'm not watching for the thing you did anymore. I'm now watching for you. For, and yeah. I, yeah so. so that's good. I, you know, I have a lot of people that follow me because of the cancer journey, right? Exactly. And that's, that's kind of, they just want to see what Owen is up to now. Exactly so. so. That's really good. That's really which is why being your authentic self and weaving your narrative, even when you're doing how-to content, yes. weaving your narrative and your why, yeah. or even where you're at right now into that, something I've been working more on, you've been seeing that, yes, is absolutely. Uh, I like advocating for the fact that I went to community college. I'm a community college dropout. I'm a big advocate for community college and trade skills. Yeah. And it's because I think that's wildly accessible to more people, especially if they're financially, they're broke like I was. Right. And um, that, hey, I went with uh, no formal college degree. Yeah. I am college educated, but I was local community college. Yeah. I'm a multiple six-figure entrepreneur. I've been doing this for and a number of years. And that endears people to you because they're thinking, I am too, right? Getting your exactly. audience to say, that's me, right? We, we focus a lot on that in-, in Community and identity right. and the authenticity of a story that's relatable because where I'm at may not be relatable to people, but that's aspirational. Yeah. The connecting tissue of that is where I came from. Right. And if I don't acknowledge where I came from, then you don't believe that you can get what I have. You might not even believe that I have what right. I have. You, they, oh, you're some rich kid. You're some rich kid. Your dad bought you. And I know even I've done that, right? And I'm watching people, not you, of course, but like other people on you. I mean, ah, I bet you got started with all the, yeah, an inheritance, I bet, you know, this kind of thing. And it, it, it yeah. stifles your own creativity, doesn't move the industry forward. Let's talk about analytics. I want to talk, I want to hear about, you know, your analytic process, what do you, what numbers are you looking for and how does that affect your content? Maybe like the top one or two things that, that you are just focused on right now analytically. I am focused heavily on watch time. I mean, I look at click-through rates. I encourage everyone else to look at click-through rates. I am not prioritizing that even though it would get me more views. Mm -hmm. the, the first barrier in uh, YouTube is get the click. You know, yeah. I tell people get the damn click. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. And as long as you deliver value, I no longer care how you do it. I used to be very anti-clickbait. 
I only want someone to have a good experience watching your video. I don't care how you get them there anymore. Okay, that's good. Um, I get clickbaited a lot. You know, I saw something the other day, and I was like, oh, man, I want to see that. And it never, the thing I clicked on never actually appeared in the video. No, I but want I to, didn't. I want, now I want people to, like, the thing, I want the delivery to happen at some point, and yeah. that's my only requirement. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I didn't even mind that much, I because I did like the video. And it's, I, it wasn't even until, like, later on that I realized, oh, I, I never even saw that thing happen right over here. Yeah. And, but I enjoyed the video. I want people to deliver on the promise at some point point yeah. in the video yeah so that's that's a personal um, philosophy you know philosophy philosophy where does watch time begin for you so I look at the watch time and retention of that yeah because early drop-off yeah means that I'm fighting an uphill battle for keeping people is that common is that like a thing that it's common yeah it's common I find it's less common if you reiterate that what you came here for is what's going to happen what about if you repeat it like it's the, it's on the title it's yes. on the thumbnail and you say it you, you know. I think doing that with a cold open and then I think also in your cold open, you have to show some personality, kind of like an SNL type. Oh, I agree. And yeah. then, because this is what our friend um, Daryl Eves, the master of all of this, calls the yeah. hook. But I have another thing that I think is important in the beginning and in the beginning of that hook that can be helpful yeah. if it's information-based content. Okay. So if it's information-based content, which most of your audience like is Like a how-to type or, of... Or a business thing or whatever it is, right. or even, uh, even if it's a business vlog, which is becoming more popularized, yeah. I think that to some extent, in an entertaining or at least a higher energy or at least in a relatable way, you almost have to lay out the table of contents. Mm -hmm. So yes, you reiterated the title, but now you're getting into the specifics of why you should keep watching throughout, okay. throughout. To so remind. the why behind it. Because then they're like, I'm still waiting for that thing. So I'm gonna keep watching. How soon am I gonna get to that number two thing out of right. the three things? Like if it's three things, I'm like, okay, I do want those three things. Right. So I'm gonna try and watch as long as possible to get all three of those things. Right. Like if you decide to order a 10 piece chicken nugget, you're not, you're gonna look at eight and you're gonna be like, where are the other two? Right. Right. Yeah. So like expectations. So I think setting expectations and delivering on them in the beginning of the video is what actually drives retention rates higher and overall watch time do higher. Do you do that? Do you do that comedically? Do you do that sort of outlandishly? Or can you just like say it? Like you just say, hey guys, if you're in this video, you're gonna get three points and I'm gonna go through them. You know what? You go to conferences, you see all these high energy extroverts and you get exhausted just looking at them, if you're me. But then it's your turn. You have to build relationships, you have to deliver on value, and you have to find a way to do that without being dead to the world a week afterwards. So today, I am going to give you my 10 best networking tips for introverts. That's good. And I promise you, that you're not going to feel exhausted watching this video. I'm gonna teach you exactly how to do this and how to survive the next conference that you're at and fend off the energy vampires. Let's get into the video. That's really good. So, you know, you kind of like with the relatable problem or the relatable situation that this video will apply to. Exactly. And again, reinforcing the fact that I identify with the audience. I'm just like, oh, wow, that's how I feel. That's what I yeah, think about. Right. It's like, and then the jokes with the like, oh, it's exhausting just watching them. It's like, yes. oh, yes, preach. People, and then, yeah. Oh, and yeah, then the whole the energy time. vampire thing is like, oh, that's like, oh, I, if you've heard that, you're like, oh, yeah. And if if you haven't heard that, it's like, oh yeah, it's just like that. And I you guess. may have, yeah, if you're the introvert too, you probably have heard those terms, right? So yeah. really good relatability, using that slang where it's appropriate, that's really good. Yeah. Let me ask you now uh, a little bit about you as a creator okay. uh, and sort of what you go through. My biggest question is, um, how do you deal with failure? I, I grew up as a gamer, Oban. Mm -hmm. uh, failure doesn't affect me in the same way because mm -hmm. I've been conditioned both. Um, By that a, game over and just restart? You know? Well, as a gamer and as an athlete, I've been yeah. conditioned to teach it as a learning experience. Uh -huh. If you've ever watched gamers do speed runs or anything, you know that the person who's best at the game is the person who's failed the most. Yeah. And that's because they know every single uh, thing that stands between them and their win condition. Right. So the thing is, I'm not daunted by that and I try not to internalize the failure because I'm a problem solver, I'm a critical thinker. Right. It's more data for me. Knowing what didn't work is important because I can create scenarios where I don't repeat that mistake or I don't encounter that scenario again. It's like I know now what to avoid or what to confront mm -hmm. or what I have to solve for, what I have to overcome yeah. to achieve my goal. It's important to be able to have that data and to respect that data because now you have a path forward. If you only ever, you're just constantly winning, you're never conditioned to know how to take failure gracefully and you're never conditioned to know how to get back up again. And yeah. more importantly, you have no understanding of how to apply 
this information, this experience to better yourself. Yeah, that process time yeah. after a failure, you know, even acknowledging that something was a failure, right? Like that didn't go well. Mm -hmm. And then taking time to sort of mourn the loss. That's what I say to my team is like, let's take some time and just mourn the loss, lick our wounds a little bit. And let's process this at Denny's and, and we'll, we'll talk about what but happened. But I also look for the small victory beyond the learning lesson. So how do you handle that? You know, how do you handle these? I'll, I'll give you a primary example. It's like, I personally prefer a video to get 10,000 views. Yeah, in a week or two days or what? Period, lifetime. Okay, Because right. I, I have the data from TubeBuddy and I know that, um, I know that over 80% of all videos never get 10,000 views okay. in the lifetime, in the yeah. lifetime of their upload shelf life. Good. So for me, knowing that, oh, I like 10,000 is the threshold to beat 80% of all content on YouTube. That's great. And that's it. Like, and that's it. It's not 100,000. Um, less than 5% of all videos do that. Um, less than 1% do a million. Wow. So I don't need this lofty thing. And then more importantly, I, as a public speaker, know that for the type of content I make, the biggest conferences only ever managed to sell like 5,000 mm -hmm. to 10,000 tickets. I also know that 35,000 is Madison Square Garden, one of the biggest arenas right. that you could ever sell out. So I have a perspective of what real numbers actually mean and what real humans are behind something. Right, I also respect that the reality is that at any given point, at any given time, if I'm being very specific about something, maybe there are only so many people that are trying to solve that problem at a given time. Mm -hmm. So I respect where attention is and where it isn't. So for me, the silver lining though is, if I fail to hit 10,000 views on a video, it's not the end of the world if everyone who did watch it that commented said something interesting or useful or complimentary because it means that it wasn't really a bad video. It means that everyone who saw it agreed with the video, got value from the yep. video, liked the video, which means that it just didn't have the reach, which just means it didn't have the attention or popularity as a topic mm -hmm. or the timing was it. Timing is big, yeah. And I'm like, okay. How is that my failure? Right. And the reality is, realistically, if I look at it, it's not. So, so that's a great mindset question. Let me dig deeper. And when you are in a place where something just happened, you have like, I failed, I screwed up, this is not the result I wanted. Well, I don't consider that a failure, Owen. I consider that an outcome. But talk to, okay, so you're, out, you're not happy with your outcome. Like, what do you do? Like, for me, when I'm not, I'm feeling like I didn't do something right, like, I will go to Well, here's a, the thing. I don't know that that outcome had anything to do with me not doing something right. I evaluate that first. That's what I mean. Where, where, tell me about that evaluation process. Like when I fail at something, I'm like, that didn't go well. I tend to spend time alone in a restaurant, coffee house, something where I've got like uh, some comfort food that I paid for. There's something about buying food on one of these down. Cause it's like, I can still afford this sandwich. <laughs> so I'm not all that bad, off, you know, but I'll, I'll, and I'll drink coffee and I'll process, okay. right? Like, do you have any, any, anything like that? with what was within the realm of my control. Well, actually the first thing I say is like outside of the result, outside of the outcome, yeah. am I satisfied with what I produced? Yeah, that's good. And so I look at that first and that's kind of a like yes or no question. Then I go into what is the thing that I am most satisfied with that I think I did very well here that should be repeated. Find the wins. Like, but also like, again, what was so good here that I like that should be repeated and did other people also like that thing and then that's looking at those comments and right. stuff like that what did i what do i feel in this thing could be an opportunity for improvement in my process right i am a process driven creative yeah. versus an outcome driven creative which is the difference between me and probably most people it's also the type of entrepreneur i am i'm yeah. a process driven entrepreneur more than outcome driven entrepreneur meaning that that's why I look at sustainability so much. That's good. I look at, it's not worth killing yourself to get a million dollars. It's better to be able to get a quarter million or a half a million dollars mm -hmm. and also have something left in the tank to live a life. Okay. And to know, hey, if my life changes, I don't have to change any of this process to add something else of value yeah, to, my, to yeah. my life. Like, I'll, give, I'll be real with you. Right now, there is very little in the way that I allocate my time that I would have to change right now if I got into a relationship. If I got into a relationship Ladies. today, if I got into a relationship today, realistically, I could be fair to somebody else and still operate as needed yeah. within my business and within my content so I don't have to make harder choices or sacrifice or like, I don't have to, I've made this thing right size in my life instead of letting it take over my life. Right. Yeah, because exactly. I have not set, I've made my ambition. It's not running you. 
I've made ambition right size in my life, meaning that I'm not shooting for the moon here. And that's not settling. It's understanding the consequences of my actions right. and realizing that, you know, what I might have to do to get there may not be worth it because realistically, have I ever gotten there and did, how happy was I? Did I ever achieve this and how happy was I? What did I get out of doing that? All right, was it worth the cost? Right. The juice worth the squeeze? Right. You have to decide that. I can't tell you that, that I can't tell you that that's worth it. I and as we, you. as we continue to, to kind of like climb these ladders of success and like get higher up, like everybody is talking about the quality of life, right? There, yeah. no one's talking about, oh, I'm so glad I made all this money. I'm so glad I got yeah. to stay in this hotel. It's always about, I'm, I'm spending time with my kids. Like the, I'm, I'm buying a house and I'm set, I'm, I'm getting out of the chaos. And, and that's something we I'm have to be. I'm reducing the stress. I'm reducing yeah. the, the fame is fun. Don't get me wrong. Like we, we all enjoy that season. Uh, but as you kind of progress through that season, you start to really, uh, you know, start to uh, look forward to these moments of quiet and just being personally developed with the people that you love. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my shorthand version is learn to put failure in its place. Yeah, that's good. It has a place and it has things to teach you. Put it in your place. Don't let it become overwhelming. Don't let it dictate for you your value. Okay. Okay. Don't let failure determine and rule over your decisions in life. Yeah. Put it in its proper place and right. use it as a tool right. and use it as a guide. What about um, handling wins without, I, I guess what I'm reading is like, how do you handle these wins? You've got a lot of wins. Yep. Um, you know, everywhere I go, in fact, I got a message from Anisha Collins uh, right before we did this interview, and she's yeah. a fellow, you know, cancer patient with me, and, oh, and nice. she, uh, she said, Roberto, are you gonna see Roberto Blake? I wanna meet Roberto Blake. That happens so often at these yeah. conferences. So how do you continue to like experience success without, you know, getting to this place where you're just kind of arrogant and douchey? I think part of it's being process driven. That's my version. My version is I'm about the process because but I also think it has to do with a very negative aspect of my personality. I'm bad at celebrating victories. Okay. I'm bad at celebrating. I know it. exactly what you mean. So, and you know, having a, a military dad, I think is like, was for me at least part of that is that it's like, oh, you got a 95. Why wasn't it a 99? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh. We expect yeah, <laughs> yeah this. So there's so there's that aspect of it which may or may not be healthy uh, on my part. So I may not be qualified to give advice to that. But I think, right. but I think that having larger overall goals puts those wins and you acknowledge those wins and you should celebrate them but I think having bigger loftier goals and knowing this is actually still just part of the process yeah this victory is a battle it's not the war yeah I think that that keeps me humble because I might have achieved something that for somebody else is the moon and stars for me I transversed a hill today yeah and sure and that may sound by itself conceited but it's not it's just saying that it's, it's relational and it's proportional, it's relative. Yeah, I think if I were your therapist, I'd be like, I'd be like, you should spend more time with that. You should actually enjoy that, right? That's what I try to do. And I I can over-celebrate, right? Like I either over-celebrate or don't celebrate at all. You know what I mean? And yeah. it's, it's finding that finding that balance. And I think that's the key is to figure out what, like figuring out what for you makes sense. Because for some people, they absolutely should celebrate overcoming hardship and they should celebrate it for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think that that will help them when they have to confront a, a greater difficulty and, and that's something, and you have to figure out what that means for you. 100%. For me, I mean, and as fluffy or woo-woo as that sounds, for me, what it really comes down to is I focus on what I can control and yeah. I let go of the things I can't control. Mm -hmm. And I also try to process my reactions and I just try to be thoughtful. Yeah. And the other thing is because I'm an introvert, um, there's not like, aside from celebrating with friends who knew what it took to get there, there is, and family obviously, there's like, there's not a lot of people to brag to or to flex on and I don't really care about those things. Yeah. I'm not um, materialistic, so no matter how much money I make, my lifestyle is not gonna change much beyond um, utility, it's meaning I, yeah. I scale lifestyle. A couple creature comforts. You creature know. comforts, well, because I also think that there's a such thing as like, creating, well, I have a new thing that I call the happiness equation. It's probably not original. Someone else probably uh, has that. But my version of the happiness equation is I look at it like net worth. I look about net happiness. Yeah. But I think that what people don't do is the same way I talk about passive income and automating that to make higher and higher amounts of money. Right. People don't create a system in their life that keeps adding to their happiness in all scenarios. 100%. In all scenarios we to balance things, out hardship. Yeah, we do things that we hate, that we're not good at, because it makes money or it pays the bills or you've always done it or whatever and then you end up, you know. But you gotta do better than break even. People 
are breaking even if they're not going into a happiness deficit. Or worse, man, they're they're, in, they're in a deficit. Yeah. Well, they they might be in a happiness deficit, not just a financial deficit, which that that's part of it. But if you're in a happiness deficit, meaning you have all this success, like look at the wealthy people we've met and know that they're not happy. Yeah. They have all these success and all these trappings and all these things, but they don't have anything that as an individual reflects their happiness and in terms of the experiences they need to right. have every day because the hardship and struggles and things they've done both collectively but even on a daily basis do not result in a net outcome we know all these people yeah. who have millions and millions of dollars but they're not nearly as happy with people who have less and that's not because money is in any way evil or wrong. It's right. because their equation is lopsided. The sacrifices it took for them to yes. get there compounded. There's so much negativity yeah. in terms of what the pain was, the pain threshold to get there and then even to keep it is so high. And they haven't, those the material things that they bought and the experience that they have have not been so overwhelmingly good or have not been so overwhelmingly good long enough. Right to make that equation balance out to even break even, right. let alone not having them at a deficit. Somebody else, on the other hand, once they eliminate that $10,000 in credit card debt, mm -hmm. and then they start crushing it, even without making $100,000, they're gonna be happier than that millionaire because the, the hardship and struggles that they had to go through to get to a better place right. were not so astronomical. And then they're also making sure that day to day, they're doing enough to be very happy and they've surrounded themselves with just enough comforts and just right. enough things to maintain an even keel of happiness every and day. Knowing your own, yeah, knowing your own, uh, what makes you happy, what's gonna give you those serotonin kicks, right? Because yeah. guys like us, like we, we accomplish a lot. You and I are doers, we do yeah. stuff, right? Uh, but then we recharge, you know, and you go out and you do again. Like for me, accomplishment, achievement is part of the happiness quotient. Like I wouldn't be, people talk about, oh, I would just lay on the beach in Hawaii all day. Like that, that would, would make not. me miserable. Oh, I would yeah. be miserable. I would, it's a good weekend, a good, maybe like a week or two vacation, but like I, I want to, I can't even do a We week. did a week just in November and, and my mind is the whole time is like, oh, we could, we could put like a little, Tiki bar here, and like I'm thinking about how like entrepreneurial activities that could be going on. In I'm this not town. happy if I'm not creating. Yeah. I'm not happy. Now, I don't have to make that work. It just happens sometimes to turn out that way. Yeah. But like I went to Sony Camera Camp for like it was four or five days up in uh, Flathead Lake in Montana, and we wow. went to Glacier National Park, and like almost nobody heard from me in social media. I think you remember this. Almost nobody heard from me in social media for like four days. Yeah. They were like, Are you okay? It's like, yeah. Oh, wait, no, you're in the mountains. That's right. Yeah. Well, are you alive, City Slicker? Yeah. Are you like, yeah. <laughs> but they forget I was a Boy Scout, right? Right? But I'm sitting out there, I'm taking these photos of these elk. I'm sitting here taking, you've seen the shots and I've got so many compliments yeah. on like, I know you said you were passionate about photography, Roberto, but I didn't know you were, you were a legit photographer. Right. You were like actually like good. You, you, could, you could actually do that. You could actually go and travel the world and be a photographer if you wanted to. Like they, like they don't realize that I kept that for myself. Yeah, exactly. I kept that's that big. my entire time. Right. That was for me because that's where the happiness lies is I like doing the creative stuff that I don't monetize. Right. I like doing the creative stuff that you don't see. Right. And that is part of my happiness equation. I like that, like when I was struggling and I was broke, when I was like totally broke, I pawned all my video games and video game systems and I grew up as a gamer, I love that, that hurt my heart. Yeah. I'm older now and happy and successful and while I, I don't go back to like playing eight hours of Call of Duty like I did back in the yeah. day, I now make some time for it to where I'm like on my weekends or in the nights when I'm like bored or something like that when I've literally said hustle mode is off. Right. I sit there and I have that thing now. I have every game system. And I have that thing. Yeah. And my new my new hobby, my like, was I don't consider it a materialistic hobby. My hobby is actually going back and actually collecting all the old video game systems and like rebuilding my collection. That's cool. Because it's for me internally. I I don't know that I'll ever document it or make a vlog out of it. But like for me, it's kind of like I'm going back for all these pieces of my childhood. Yeah because That's of all, so the, me, all the things that I gave up and all the things where I became an adult too early in life, I'm going back and I'm reclaiming that. I'm, I taking, that. I'm taking it back. I right? love that. We do the same thing. I do the same thing with like old toys that I had, stuffed animals, and I give them to my kids. And it was really yeah. neat to see my kids' bedrooms kind of filled with the, the nostalgia from my childhood. And then we even have extended, you, you were a gamer. I was like a music guy. So I was like yeah. Columbia House CDs and like 13 CDs for a penny. So I had all these CDs and I'm slowly sort of rebuilding up that, that library back on, on yeah. iTunes. So, all right, um, let me get to the speed round here. I'm gonna ask you five quick questions and I want you to tell me like your favorite, okay? okay. 
Um, so let's talk about what is, and it's like right now, because I know those favorites change, right? So what's your favorite right now? What is your favorite song? Right now is probably Remember This by NF. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, we listen to a lot of NF, actually. Okay, great. What is your favorite movie right now? Right now, this one probably makes no sense to people, but um, probably right now, my favorite movie, because I'm on this nostalgia kick, yeah. is probably um, Karate Kid Part 2. That's great. Oh, that's such a good one. Because I'm into Cobra Kai a lot, so yeah. I uh, love the way that they're bringing him back and, and really capitalizing on that. Okay, favorite like TV series or streaming series? Right now is actually The Morning Show. Really from, on Apple, right? Yeah, Apple show. because I like how well written it is. Okay. Like the the well written, the dialogue, the monoto the the um, the monologue moments and everything like that. Regardless of the subject matter, I just think that it is one of the best well written dramas I've actually seen cool. in a very long time. I love what Jennifer Aniston is doing with her character. Yeah, I love seeing the range of what. Um, God, why am I spacing on his name? Steve Carell. Yeah, um, I love seeing something completely different from him sure. and seeing the range of his character and ability what he's doing with the character Mitch yeah fascinating I can't wait to check it out I've, I don't know I've, I've avoided drama because I'm just a comedy guy but I really it has some good comedic timing and moments and you'll enjoy it I will you know I just I'm addicted to I always default to comedy because it's usually like towards the end of a long day okay who's your favorite youtuber right now right now oh, that's a very good question that's a very good question Favorite YouTuber in terms of watching and enjoyment or yeah. favorite YouTuber? Yeah, watching and enjoyment or even like just someone who's doing some especially cool things that you, you're enjoying seeing yeah. that. So like right now, I think um, my two favorites are uh, Sarah Dietschy right now, mm -hmm. a good friend for a very long time now, and a, a small YouTuber, uh, Viper. Oh uh, yeah, Viper's great. I, yeah, I love Viper and I think that he has Joe Rogan like qualities and potential as oh, an cool. as an interviewer for yeah. his live streams. I like I like his tech stuff, but I like watching his interviews more. Okay. And so and I like that he as a small YouTuber has brought the the community together and he's letting big YouTubers express things they can't talk about That's on their cool. own channel I'm in terms check of that out, telling Viper. The, yeah. I love so it. I, I, yeah, Viper the man about tech. Love what he's doing. I think of him as a tech guy. Yeah. yeah, Sarah what she's been doing and just watching her evolution as a creator has been very fascinating and I also like seeing the results of her delegating um, things so like as a case study as a content creator and then also just watching like her content i love her style of content yeah. and she and she keeps it fun she keeps it fun and informative and light and so i love what she's doing um someone i think who might be i'm trying to remember there was somebody i was watching and i was thinking about them and i'm like this person might be the ideal content creator right mm -hmm. now and i'm spacing on because it wasn't somebody i normally watch and if i remember i'll tell you but i was watching someone i was like this might be the ideal content creator wow yeah that's cool. Well, stay tuned for that. We'll definitely reveal that. Name a book that's changed your life. There's so many. I have a hundred of them. I'm going to go in a way that uh, most people wouldn't expect. I'm going to go with um, a fiction book. I'm going to okay. go with a fiction yeah, book. Yeah, good. So um, one of the, actually, this one's really good. So there's this fiction book. Uh, it's a high epic fantasy, mm -hmm. very Game of Thrones-like. Okay. Um, David Gemmel's uh, book, Sword in the Storm. It's part of a four-part series. Nice. And then it got me to read all of uh, the 22 of his books. Um, wow. One of the saddest days I remember is hearing that he passed away. So he's a UK author. Um, and like I love his tape on epic hero fantasy and the way he writes these characters because he writes flawed heroes yeah. and he writes he writes flawed heroes and he writes coward heroes wow he, people who have to overcome an internal flaw in their character on behalf of either um a cause or a life-threatening circumstance or to um to make something right with somebody right. or because they want forgiveness or because they fell in love yeah. like they 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 aspire to be better than they are mm -hmm. or quote unquote have a right to be right they rise to the moment cool and i feel that in a time when i was growing up and i didn't really have like a mentor and my i had an estranged relationship with my father i was very angry with him when i was in college um for a lot of reasons um we've since you know had a better relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in that time when you are navigating the beginnings of your your journey as a man, as an adult, as a young man, I was looking for something to relate to in other people and I wasn't seeing it yeah. in anybody that I encountered. And I found it in these fictional characters. I found these qualities of 
um, I would say, nobility of yeah, character, sure. of character, and even with, in spite of their flaws, and not trying to cover those flaws, but trying to supersede them, to become better men. Right. And having a reason for becoming better men. So That's cool. that meant something to me. That's big. I like that. Love that a lot. Roberto, thanks for your time. We went deep today. I yeah. hope you guys enjoyed it. Stick around. Tons more coming up. Roberto Blake and others at Social Media Marketing World 2020.